You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Finding Genius podcast. I have Jose Colon. He's a triple board certified uh, physician, which is amazing. What, what, what are the uh, three board certifications in, Jose, by the way? Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, pleasure yeah. to be here. And I'm originally uh, board certified in neurology with special qualifications in child neurology. And I also did my sleep medicine training at Vanderbilt along with the neurology training. So I'm dual certified in that. And most recently, um, I picked up uh, board certification through the American College of, excuse me, American Board of Lifestyle Medicine. So the lifestyle medicine is my, my third board. That's amazing. I mean, you know, we all know how easy it is to become board certified. You just, you just pick them up like, you know, whatever you feel like, it seems like. It's amazing. Congrats to you <laughs> for your, that's a lot of hard work. I know that. I mean, I don't know personally, but I mean, it's a lot of hard work, so that's that's great that you've done that. It, it, it is. It has been a lot of hard work over the years, but also at the same time, nothing in life is easy. Everything that, that you have, you've worked for. Everything that our listeners have had, they've worked hard for as well. So, you know, um, we all do important things. Okay. And I know as part of the bio, um, you, know, you specialize in sleep disorders. You've, you've authored a couple books, The Sleep Diet, A Novel Approach to Insomnia, and I guess the children's sleep book, The Magic Ice Cream Palace, and Sometimes I Dream. For infant sleep. Um, what, so you've been around the sleep world. You've done a lot there. Uh, what, what's your current focus and your current interest in the world of sleep? What fascinates you most right now? Well, I do full-time sleep medicine in both adults and, and children, and that's um, uh, what, what I do on a, on a daily basis. Um, over a period of time, I found a, a couple things. One, that, that I was repeating a lot of the information uh, over and over and over again. And two, you know, I, I kind of ran into this issue that medications just don't really seem to work. People develop tolerance. I mean, everything is approved and during a study, but you know, studies study a short period of time. They don't look at, at, at things over the, the long term many times. And having, you know, as I said, you know, that I found myself repeating myself multiple times, I said, why don't I accumulate information and, and I can put it uh, in, in a book and also having gone through the experience that medications didn't really seem to, to help over the long term. I'm like, all right, let me learn about as many non-pharmacologic treatments as we can. So I started learning about behavioral sleep medicine and then started learning about hypnosis, um, mindfulness-based stress reduction. And my, my practice in sleep medicine is incorporating this integrative and holistic uh, approach. And my books were made as creative. They're not like a set of instructions of, okay, this is what you do to go to sleep. No, they're actually interactive, uh, fun books for both uh, women with insomnia as well as children um, of, of any age. And um, kind of like a get, get sleep right the first time infant uh, book. So... Uh, a lot of a lot of passions in life that I've integrated together. You do sleep medicine right now. What are some of the um, the main things that you run into? What are really common sleep issues? And then maybe let's talk about some that are rare but uh, impactful or interesting to you. 
So one of the most common things that we do see is obstructive sleep apnea. Um, obstructive sleep apnea is difficulty with breathing in your in, in your sleep. Um, how common is this? Males from 30 to 60 years of age have a 25% incidence of sleep apnea. It's pretty high if you consider that you know asthma is 5% of the population. Well, uh, sleep apnea can be 25%. And then after um, after menopause and after 50 years of age, the incidence in males and females is about the same. So in adult population, there's about 25% incidence of sleep apnea. And then in the pediatric population, we're learning a lot more about sleep disorders and the developing mind and ADHD. And um, what's interesting is 2% of children have obstructive sleep apnea, but anywhere from 10 to 20% can have something called primary snoring. So I see a lot of kids that are snoring but not all of them have sleep apnea, kind of like the adult population. And of course, these are, are treated in, in different ways as well. So the first part of the question that you asked me is what are some of the common things that, that we see? And that's some of the more common things that we see. Uh, we also do see insomnia. Insomnia, 30 to, to 40 percent of the population at one time is, is struggling with, uh, with sleep. That's, that's pretty high. And there's a, a number of, of reasons for this. Um, sometimes there's something called psychophysiological insomnia. And that means that some people have difficulty sleeping because something's bothering them. And what's bothering them is they're not asleep. So kind of like uh, the harder people try to sleep, uh, the more alert that they become. And uh, those are some of the more common things. And then rare but important things. Sometimes I do see nocturnal seizures. Other times I do see patients with, with narcolepsy or idiopathic hypersomnia, which are brain-based disorders of sleepiness, even though they're getting adequate sleep. And what, um, I don't know, what, what segment of the population, again, do you, I don't know, do you feel is probably most underserved by any kind of sleep medicine? Is it children? Is it adults with apnea? Is it, you know, people with narcolepsy? Well, I think equally throughout the board, um, a, a lot of these are underserved. So the, the vast majority of patients with, that actually have sleep apnea have yet to be diagnosed. You know, they come to me when they got a colonoscopy done and they stopped breathing at the table. Well, guess what? They didn't have it from the colonoscopy. They've had it for, you know, a decade before that. And it wasn't until that event that, that brought them in. And likewise, in the pediatric population, we see um, uh, a lot of underdiagnosis of sleep disordered breathing and narcolepsy. Narcolepsy in particular is pretty underdiagnosed. Um, the average onset of symptoms is about 15 to, to 19 years of age, but many times people aren't diagnosed until after a, a decade later of, of having had these symptoms of, of sleepiness and they're like, oh, well, you're depressed. You're having a sedating antidepressant. Well, you could see how that's not going to necessarily help. But yeah, that's some of the, the, the common and underserved things that we see. So what, what are some of the places where advancements taking place in sleep medicine? Is it, I mean, well, let me back it up. Is it that the technology is there to help people? It's just getting people to understand they need it and getting diagnosis on people? Or is it that new technology is needed and what we have is not adequate for certain conditions like apnea, snoring, et cetera? I mean, everything that you said is, is true. You've obviously researched this, you know, so... Um, you're, you're pretty well versed in this. Um, if I can add to, to what you said is um, medical education actually isn't um, up to snuff with, with where it should be. For example, when I did my, my uh, medical school training, I received one lecture on sleep apnea. Um, and then I received a, a lecture on medications for sleep by a psychiatrist. And, and that was it. But when I did my primary care residency, I got no lectures on, on sleep. And then I decided to become a, a child neurologist. And at Vanderbilt, the, the Department of Sleep Medicine was through the Department of Neurology. And that's the first exposure that I got of, of sleep. So, the, you know, I loved it and, and ran with it. But the majority of the docs that are out there have not had any information about about. Uh, sleep. So I'm not saying that that, that that we're bad docs or anything like that. I'm just saying no, that, that the exposure uh, hasn't hasn't been there for, for us to even think about. And people say, you know, the, 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 the mind cannot, the eye does not see what the mind does not know. And, and if you aren't taught these as possibilities, you're, you're going to miss it. So um, at home, okay, so I know that diagnosis for apnea 
uh, will happen either with a sleep study where you'll go to a lab or they have home sleep study kits. What, what are you uh, suggesting to patients and why? Are you suggesting both or one or the other depending on their circumstance? Yeah, I have some suggestions that are important, but, you know, equally as important as a consideration is what's the insurance company going to pay for, you know, and many times the type of study that you get is is dictated by the insurance. And what I'll say is that both of them may potentially give adequate information. The gold standard is a facility sleep study. Now, these home studies, it's the new rage. Everyone is talking about them. Everyone wants them. They come in saying that they want a home study. Um, but what people don't understand is that they're not truly home sleep studies, they're home sleep apnea studies. And they were made for the sole purpose of detecting sleep apnea. The majority of these home studies actually don't look at brain activity. So they're not looking at at sleep quality. They're not looking to see if you're getting into the into the stages of, of sleep. And another thing that people don't realize is that they're not as accurate as facility study and can underestimate. So anyone who has had a home study, a home sleep apnea study, uh, and it doesn't come back conclusive for sleep apnea, they actually, uh, through the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, they do uh, man- recommend that a facility study be done. Looking at disorders, other disorders such as nocturnal seizures or REM behavior disorder, restless legs, periodic limb movements of sleep, um, these are all things that you need a facility study that's looking at at the the brain activity as opposed to just a, a home study. So the home study is good enough to get a CPAP or an oral appliance, or do you think that the uh, you know if insurance will pay for it, the uh, lab sleep study is better? So I, your your first statement is correct, but let me um, add on to it. You know your statement was a home study is good enough to uh, get CPAP or an oral appliance, yes, that is true, comma, however, they are not good enough to exclude a sleep apnea. So uh, again, yes, they can diagnose sleep apnea, but if, if one comes back negative, then a facility study is indicated. My clinical experience, what I've seen several times is that they underestimate and they can underestimate by 10 points. And, and what do I mean by that? So if someone has difficulty breathing five times per hour, that's sleep apnea, something called an AHI or apnea hypopnea index. The name isn't important. Though. The concept that I'm saying is that if someone has difficulty breathing five times per hour, that's sleep apnea. So I have seen these studies, they come back to me and saying, okay, negative at three times per hour. But then when we do a facility study, they could be off by 10. And I, I could see that they stop breathing 13 or 15 times per hour. You know, So uh, it's important that if if one comes back negative, that a facility study is done afterwards. And if someone comes back positive, does that mean that their apnea is, is pretty significant? Or is it just the nature of home studies could be, you know, off base for certain people? Or is it only catch serious people? So uh, if they come back positive, they can diagnose it. You know, so yeah. And, you know, I tell them, look, you stop breathing this many times per hour, that's sleep apnea. Now, it might be more, okay? It might be more severe than what it currently is than what the study is saying. Um, but yeah, so it is good enough to, to diagnose. And what about um, snoring? Do people come to you and say, uh, you know, hey, I, I can't sleep in the bed with so-and-so. They're snoring my head off. And if so, is that always because of apnea or is snoring itself something that can and should be treated? So not all snoring is sleep apnea. Not everyone who has sleep apnea snores. Um, and there's different types of, of sleep apnea as well. Um, but snoring in an adult really is um, a, a very big sign that a patient may have uh, sleep apnea. And um, even if it comes back negative for sleep apnea, the dental devices are great for for, uh, for snoring in someone who's negative for sleep apnea. I, I really advocate for them. I use one myself, and uh, I notice an improvement in, in sleep quality. Snoring in a child, uh, if if you recall, 2% of children have sleep apnea, whereas 10 to 20% of children, almost 10 times more common, have primary snoring, which means that there's a vibration from snoring, but they don't actually have uh, sleep apnea present. I hope that clarifies. Hey, yeah. Have you seen cases where the person has apnea, but there's no audible snoring? I see people all the time that they tell me that they don't snore, 
um, and we do a sleep study on them. And we do have microphones, and and uh, and we are able to pick up audible snoring and and uh, sleep apnea being present. And then there's a different type of apnea called central apnea that the brain just doesn't take a breath, you know, and you're not going to see snoring with that. That's more common in, in neurologic disorders or, or patients on, on opiates or, or patients with congestive heart failures. Okay. All right. Gotcha. Um, so as someone that uses an oral appliance, uh, tell me about your experience with it. Like what, what did you find difficult about it? What did you notice, you know, when you first used it versus later on? So when I first used it, um, the, the, the very first night that I used it, I, I had like a lot more dream sleep, a lot more REM sleep. That's something that I noticed. Um, one thing that was an adjustment is the very first night they use it, your teeth kind of hurt the next morning, kind of like if you had braces, but anyone who's had braces will tell you your teeth don't hurt forever. You know, there's, 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 uh, an adjustment period and it took a couple of days to adjust. And then, you know, now it's been a couple of years and it's like, uh, and it's like nothing. But the biggest thing that, that I do notice is that sleep quality is, is a lot better. If, if, so the, the theory of the oral appliance is to advance your jaw because it, during sleep, does your jaw fall back? Or like, why wouldn't you have a sleep appliance that just keeps your jaw in its neutral, you know, occlusion or bite position and not advance it? Why, why isn't that enough? Yeah, so I, you know, I have a great diagram that that I show to my patients, um, but uh, obviously can't do that on a, on a, on a podcast here. But um, trying to, to draw it out mentally, um, just kind of picture your, your airway. And part of what happens in sleep apnea is that the upper airway collapses. And in particular, the base of the tongue collapse into the, into the airspace. Now, just yourself, just kind of wiggle your jaw and, and move it, move it forward you know, advance the bottom part of your jaw forward and you can see how that's bringing um, more space. And then I'll, I'll even do kind of like a, uh, a demonstration with my patients where, where I say, okay, I'm going to make a snoring sound. Uh, now I just made a snoring sound. Now I'm going to move my jaw forward. Now I'm going to try to make that sound. Now I'm not, not able to do that. And I have them kind of do that as well. And they're like, oh, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Mm. So, um, but again, when you're sleeping, let's say you're sleeping on your back, which seems to be the you know the worst position for apnea, is it that the tongue is falling back, but the jaw position stays the same, or is the jaw itself, the lower jaw, relaxing backwards and downwards as well? The the airway collapses, the the jaw relaxes, and the tongue collapses with the jaw collapsing, and then when you stabilize the jaw, you stabilize the airway. Okay, so it may not be effective enough, but if, even if you put in an oral appliance and it just kept your mouth at neutral and then you laid on your back and sleep, that would probably be a little bit better than the jaw falling back as well, a few millimeters, right? Correct. And you can have the jaw at neutral or you can advance it uh, a little bit a little bit more. So either one of those uh, are helpful. Oh, so if you advance it, it's probably falling back to neutral anyway when you're laying down. No, because it's um, advanced and uh, it's set to a particular point that it doesn't oh, okay. it doesn't come back, so it's locked. Oh, it's anchored into the top. Okay, right into the top jaw. Got it. There you go. That's a great word. Anchored. It's anchored forward. That's a great word. Any any difficulties with the oral appliance? I mean, is the mouthpiece open enough that it's easy to breathe through your mouth, or you you know do you have to breathe through your nose to use it? No, you can breathe through your nose or through your mouth, and and, and most people do a little bit a combination of. Them. I mean, would it make sense for someone to wear it for like, you know, an hour, uh, you know, an hour a day at first to get used to it and then wear it for the whole night or just put it in and try to sleep with it the whole night, the first night? Just put it in and try to sleep with it. You know, uh, let me, you know, kind of answer the question a, a different way. D does it make sense to, to breathe in your sleep for just one hour uh, or throughout the whole night? You know, I'm not being sarcastic, but that's, you know, questions that, you know, people ask me and the, when, when you rephrase it that way, they're like, yeah, I guess it does make sense to, to breathe the whole night. You know, people even ask me with the CPAP, should I just use it for a couple hours? Well, I mean, how many hours in your sleep do you want to breathe? They're like, oh, yeah, I guess throughout the whole night, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Since you've been wearing one for years, have you noticed that your lower jaw has permanently advanced? Like, has it changed the, the shape of your face? Has it done any, like, myofunctional therapy on you? None at all. It's it's been it's been fine. Um, 
because it just does it overnight. It doesn't advance it forever. Now, it does need to be monitored by a dentist, and I do have a dentist that, that monitors it. Um, but, um, no, these things uh, help more than they cause problems. Okay. But, you know, the same is the same is true with CPAP. You know, someone uses a mask to help them breathe during the evening. You know, I, I have seen skin breakdown or, or, or rashes. You know, some things work for some people. Other other things, they, other people need other other types of treatments. Yeah, I was going to ask you, uh, with CPAP versus oral appliance, which one is easier for people to use and continue to use? CPAP by far is the gold standard. Um, the dental devices, however, have better data in, 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 in terms of uh, compliance and, and preference. Now, having said that, CPAP is appropriate for all sleep apneas. The oral appliances is more pertinent for mild sleep apneas or sometimes mild to moderate. They're really not indicated in severe sleep apnea unless someone has really failed CPAP. Then, you know, reducing the severity a little bit is better than continuing with a, with a, with a severe sleep apnea. And I guess there's some people that, that use both, right? You know, um, I think the use of both is underutilized. And the role for, for using both, let's say both at the same time, okay, is if someone has a really bad sleep apnea that they need high pressures and they're having to- problems tolerating it, moving your jaw forward while you have the CPAP on helps reduce the amount of pressure that, that you use. So that's, that's one way. Now, another way is sometimes people alternate. And yeah, I do have patients that they are comfortable with their CPAP, they like it, but if they travel, they just use the dental device. Or I have one patient that's a bachelor, he loves his CPAP, but when he has a honey who stays over, he puts the thing away and he uses the the dental device when he goes to sleep. (laughs) And you know, if there is such a thing on average, how much of an improvement do people experience and how do they express the improvement to you? You know, they express by just saying, hey, it's it's helping, you know. Sometimes we can monitor people on, on Fitbit devices or uh, other devices. Um, and, and typically the other thing that we do is that we repeat a study uh, on the on the device and, and we make sure that, that it is improving so we can get that concrete information that it is. And then for you with the oral appliance, I mean, you noticed that you were dreaming more, which sounds like your REM sleep may have been less interrupted. But, it, you know, were there short-term effects and then long-term effects? You know, things you noticed immediately like that and then things you noticed after, let's say, a month? Like, you know, a little bit more about your experience, if you don't mind. Yeah, so my concentration definitely was a lot better when I started using it on a, on a regular basis. Um, and then, you know, when this is not unique to the dental device. Um, when I do CPAP on patients and I do sleep studies on them and I put the CPAP on them, I see something called REM rebound. And, and yeah, with the sleep apnea, They've had fragmented REM sleep and less REM sleep, and then all of a sudden now they're breathing. And that first night in particular, they hit something called REM rebound, where they may get a very significant amount of in- increased REM. And that's that's actually what I experienced. That first night, I had a lot of, of REM rebound. Now, I still dream and I still go through REM, but uh, you, you notice it in particular that very first night. It's like, whoa, that's what I've been missing. <clears throat> and it- like, would you characterize your experience as a massive improvement or just a, a slight improvement? No, I would say, you know, it's a significant improvement. Um, and over over time, as I've been dreaming more, I've actually learned uh, the concept of lucid dreaming, which is the ability to recognize when you're in a in a dream, which has it's been a lot of fun and is uh, definitely a different talk for a different day. <laughs> Very cool. What, so what do you see as the... Um, you know, I know I asked you this, but I'll ask you in a different way. What, what's, what does the near-term future of sleep medicine look like? Is it again just more awareness, more adoption of, you know, of uh, solutions, or again, is there new technology that you've also heard about that you think will make a big difference? I think new technology is always evolving. You know, in regards to CPAP, the technology is the same as it was 20 years ago. You know, um, but what's different is the comfort features. You know, so new mask, new expiratory pressure releases. There's always new features that are being made to, to make it a little bit more comfortable and tolerable. Um, there's also some implantable devices, kind of like a pacemaker that stimulates the upper airway. That That's uh, going to be a technology that's going to evolve over time to, to help treat uh, sleep apnea. 
And then, um, you know, there's always going to be a role for the sleep lab, but there's also uh, home sleep monitoring equipments that are in evolution as, as well. So uh, one thing that people have said is that more has been learned about sleep over the last 10 years than you know, we've known over the previous 100. And I, I believe that to be true. Yeah, and one more thing I want to ask you just in brief about children. Um, when children, well, when parents bring children to you, um, how does that happen? Is it that the child's just acting up and the parent somehow figures out that they have a sleep problem or is it that the parent has a chance observation of their sleep and notices they're snoring or something else is going on? All, all of that is correct. You know, so sometimes there's no behavioral considerations and they want to rule out sleep uh, apnea or, or periodic leg movements of sleep as, as, a, as a cause of it. Um, uh, other times I, I hear, you know, uh, something that really brings them in a lot is actually something called behavioral insomnia of childhood. And, and what that is, is, you know, kind of sleep avoiding behavior and the patient ends up in the parents bed and I do a sleep study on them and, and they're like, and I'm like, Hey, it's normal. That's good. And they're like, but how come he does this? How come, you know, and it turns out that patients always staying in the parents bed, you know, so because, you know, they, they have primary snoring and, and, and that could be normal for a child, but because the patient's in their bed, that's how it was brought to uh, attention. So sometimes there's some real sleep disorders that, that we can find. Other times there's some behavioral considerations that are disrupting the parent's sleep while the sleep of the kid is fine. Okay. Okay. Any other fundamental differences in uh, kids versus adults that you see in, in how you approach them and helping their sleep or what, you know, maybe the symptoms they have or, you know, what it does to them. So um, another thing that I work with a lot is in mindfulness-based stress reduction and um, and relaxation training. And in, in adults, that's more of a formal practice. In, in children, it's more of, of a creative, imaginative practice. And that's actually the basis of my book, The Magic Ice Cream Palace. It's a little story about a kid who's going through an ice cream palace and you captivate the kid's attention with that. And by trying to, to, to help the kid warm, warm certain parts of, of, of the body, you know, we bring our awareness to that. And, and essentially what we're doing is we're doing a body scan meditation. You know, so I do that in a creative way. In an adult, you would say, pay attention to your feet, you know, and feel them relax. In a child, you're like, ooh, you have hot chocolate boots going through the magic ice cream palace making chocolate chip ice cream, you know, so... Uh, one fundamental approach is, you know, adults, you give instructions, children, you give creativity. Yeah. Well, that sounds pretty cool. I mean, the adults could use some creativity too. <laughs> I've had a lot of adults read the book and say, God, I feel relaxed. You know, even the children's book, they're like, thank you. Thank you. Very cool. 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 Well, all right. So Jose, I know I've run you all over the place in the sleep world, but I figured, all right, we'll, we'll do a, a grand tour. Um, What's the best way for people to find out more if they suspect that themselves or their spouse or their kids are having sleep issues? And, you know, what areas do you serve? And if they're not local to you, what can they do? You know, so, you know, of course, you always say go to your primary care physician and, and, and let them know. But remember that I said many primary care physicians don't always know a lot about sleep. So another thing that you can do is you can find a locally accredited uh, sleep center. And that, you know, you could do with, with Google and American Academy of Sleep Medicine and find an accredited uh, center. So healthy sleep, healthy life. 2020 is going to rock. <laughs> Excellent. Jose, thanks for coming on the call. I appreciate it. All right, my man. Be well. You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues where we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials, or even starting to appear on shelves, or by prescription, or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. 
My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you. Thank you.